May I ask you to stand out of respect for our Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel message. And I'll read to you the beginning of the gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who's made him known. That's the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Please be seated. Christmas is about home. Christmas is about going home. Many of you will go to the Atlanta airport and get on a plane and go to places distant and far away because Christmas is about home and you want to be home with your family and people that you love and who love you and you grew up with. You want to go see moms and dads and grandparents. Many of you are already planning foods and parties and celebrations because people will be coming to your home to celebrate Christmas. Christmas is about home and about traditions and memories that are dear to you and things that happened in your childhood. I remember my childhood days in Shamley, Georgia, not that far away. We would go out and cut our own Christmas tree. Cut your own, remember cutting your own Christmas tree? And come home and spend four, maybe five hours trying to get it stand up straight and that Christmas tree stand. Call the engineers from Georgia Tech and Mass Institute of Technology. My father, one of the traditions in our home when I was growing up, my father would make a Christmas punch. My parents were not people to really drink growing up, an occasional beer. But at Christmas they drank. It was tradition. My father would pour enough bourbon in the punch to float a battleship. My mother, who didn't know much about alcohol, I guess, and certainly nothing about punch, she said, now you can't, you, you children can't have, you can have just a little sip of your father's punch, just a little sip, but you can eat all the fruit that you want. <laughs> Apparently nobody told mom that that fruit just sucks up all the alcohol. So I don't even have memory of Christmas when I was like eight or nine years old. I was inebriated, you know, it wouldn't have mattered. Christmas is about home and it's about traditions. Just the word eggnog makes me feel like I'm home for Christmas. 
Christmas in Covington, Georgia, when the boys were little. It was about home. Lisa doesn't just love to cook. When she does, she's great, but it's just not her favorite thing. But on Christmas, she would cook. And we would have cheese grits. Can I get an amen for cheese grits? I feel sorry for the Yankees of the world who don't know about cheese grits. And I don't know what Christmas would be without Lisa's cheese grits, really. And all the important things about eating healthy go out the window on Christmas. You know, it's bacon and sausage and grits, cinnamon rolls. Who cares? It's Christmas. Christmas is about home. And Alpharetta is home for us now. And boys are grown. And so this, in some ways this year, Christmas will have a little sad spot in our home for us. Because the first time in our life, Aaron, who was married to Victoria, who's from in San Antonio. So Aaron will be in San Antonio this year when Christmas comes around. And I guess I'll just have to eat his cheese grits for him. <laughs> Maybe even a little fruit out of the punch bowl. It'll be sad. And for some of you, it'll be even sadder still. My heart hurts. Part of being a minister is looking out on a congregation like this and realizing that people who are worshiping God this morning have lost people that they love and Christmas will be very different because Christmas is about family and it's about home. I hope that you'll weave the thread of worship into your family and into home and come to one or several of the services so that you can sit together and be together in the presence of God and say your prayers together and let that be part of home. Christmas is about home. And John says Christmas is about God coming home to us. That's what Christmas is. That God comes home to us. He uses very high theological words in his expression of God coming home to us. The word became flesh and lived among us, dwelt in our neighborhood, pitched a tent in our camp and bought a house across the street from us because God wants to be home with us. The way you want to be gathered as family and gathered with children and grandchildren, so almighty God comes to the earth in Jesus Christ our Lord to be at home with us. He wants to be with us the way you want to be with your children. That's God, the God who wants to be with us. Last Sunday evening, I had the great fun and privilege of being in Scottsdale, Arizona, and we went to the Desert Botanical Gardens. They have a wonderful Christmas celebration there, and they decorate cactus and other things that are just delightful. And we walked and listened to some music and came upon a woman with a telescope who had a telescope on Mars. And Mars, when you look just at Mars, it's almost like, is that a star? Is that a planet? Try to remember my Boy Scout days. Does it twinkle or not twinkle? But when you look through the, her telescope, you could see it was orange and that it was different. And then another telescope, she had me look through another telescope, and there was a constellation, a group of stars. Have mercy on me here. You can correct me in the vestibule or send me an email. I think it was Pleiades, Pleiades, such she pronounced it, a group of stars. They were so beautiful, and you could see them, and it was gas around them. She explained it and said, now those stars are 1,800 light years away. 1,800 light years away. She said light travels at about 347,000 miles per second, and for 1,800 years, the light has been traveling from the star, and you're seeing light that left 1,800 light years. It was more than I could fathom. I mean, I don't know there's a calculator that can do that. And I thought of Psalm 8 that we read a little earlier in this service. What is man or woman? What are we? Who are we that you're even interested in us? But God is interested in us and wants to be with us wants to be among us, wants to be in our neighborhood, a part of our family. And the reason that God wants to be among us is because he knows we need him. What a mess we make of the world that we live in. Look at our nation, what a mess it is. How we stir anger in each other and fight with each other and fuss with each other and get angry with each other. When I was in Arizona, they put a guy to play golf with us and we introduced ourselves. 
I'm Don Martin and Ted and, and Milt introduced himself. I said, Milt, where are you from? He says, I'm from San Francisco, California. When I sat back down in the golf cart, my friend Ted turned to me and said, don't talk politics. Just don't, just don't do it. Don't politics. Don't, don't talk politics. Well, he got to about the third hold. Milt said, it's okay if y'all want to talk politics. I heard what you said over there. <laughs> he said, I'm ashamed of my state, so talk all you want. But we make enemies. God sees, God wants to be among us because he wants to help us. Not because he's mad at us, but because he sees the solution to our problems. He sees what a mess we make of our own lives. Our thoughtless decisions out of anger, out of frustration, out of selfishness. Shakespeare put it best, what tangled webs we weave. And God comes to us in Jesus Christ and closes the distance and Christmas is about home and God comes home to us because he knows how to untangle the webs we weave and to create in us love and kindness and affection. God wants to be with us. And John combed through the dictionary, just combed through the dictionary and said, how can I explain to people who are going to read this gospel what it is that Christ is doing? And he, he found in the dictionary the word, word. The word was with God. And the word was God. And what he's trying to say is that God wants to have a word with us and speak to us. Not a word of anger, but a word that makes a difference, a message that makes a difference. When I started my journey into the computer world so many years ago, I made the foolish mistake when people wanted my email address, I would just give them my email address. I don't do that anymore. Because I gave people my email address, and now when I open my email, I spend about an hour, hour and a half deleting emails that are meaningless. Do you do that? Yes. Now I give them your email address. Because <laughs> it means nothing. I have to go through a hundred messages to get to the one message that means something to me. John says the word pitched its tent in our camp, bought a house in our neighborhood. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us to speak to us. And that that Word was full of grace and truth. And I cannot believe what John has the audacity to say because John grew up a Jew. John grew up in the synagogue hearing the law of Moses read every Sunday, hearing the commandments read every Sunday. And he has the audacity and the courage and the faith to say, now Moses gave us the law. Moses gave us the law. But from Jesus Christ, we receive grace and truth. Something better than the law. In fact, so much better that the Apostle Paul said to one of his congregations, if the law could save us, Christ died for nothing. For nothing. Grace comes to us. Mercy and kindness. We need the law. I don't want to live in a lawless world. Do you want to live in a lawless world where people don't know the rules? There are certain behaviors that you and I understand. If we engage in certain behaviors, we're going to ruin our lives. It's only a matter of time before the consequences show up and we're going to ruin our lives. So I feel grateful for the law. I have no disrespect for Moses. There's some things if we will do them, honor the Sabbath, honor our mother and our father, remember there is no God, but some things if we do, it will lead us to a good place. And so I'm very grateful for the law. I have no criticism of Moses. But John says something better than Moses has come to us in Jesus Christ. It's grace. It's grace. That's what I need, kindness and forgiveness, grace. I have two pair of jeans hanging in the closet right now. One I call law. The other I call grace. <laughs> I put on the law jeans, you know. I remember when the law dream, jeans fit nicely. But now when I put on the law jeans, they tell me how old I am. They tell me how many Oreos I've eaten. They tell me that I like bacon and cheese grits. I can't throw away the law jeans. I need the law jeans to remind me. 
but I really like my grace jeans. I really like I go to my grace jeans. I remember buying my grace jeans. I went in to the guy and he said, well, what size are you, Mr. Martin? I said, well, I'm a 38, but a 40 feels so very comfortable. I'd really like to try on a 42. <laughs> grace. And I put grace jeans on and Grace says, you're fine, man. You're doing okay. That doesn't mean ollie, ollie, in free, do whatever you want to. It means that Christ didn't come to thump us on the head, but he came to say to us, woman, stand up. Your sins are forgiven. Go. You can behave better than that. Behave better than that. What we all want from God and from other people is grace and kindness and mercy. And Christ comes into the world and gives us grace and sets us free to give other people grace. I can tell you what grace is. I don't have any grandchildren yet. I hope we'll have grandchildren in the next three or four years, maybe five years. I hope they're all girls because we look in the Martin family, it's just boys and testosterone everywhere. So please, God, let some girls show up. Some girls. But we have a grand dog. We have a grand dog. Lives in St. Petersburg, belongs to Aaron and Victoria. Aaron and Victoria are Bo's parents. They lay down the law. What he can eat and what he can't eat. When he walks, when he goes outside, what he does. They're the law. I'm grace. <laughs> Bo comes and sits in my lap. He just loves to be on my lap. I'm in the lazy boy chair. Bo really loves you, Dad. Oh, yeah, he loves me. What Aaron doesn't know is I've got two pieces of bacon in my left pocket. <laughs> it's called grace. Bo knows when he comes to me, there's grace. Isn't that what you want from God? This grace and forgiveness and kindness. And here's the difference that it makes in your life. When you open your heart to mercy and kindness and you receive from Jesus Christ grace, it's so much easier to give grace and kindness to everybody else. Now you stop your demanding ways, not asking people to toe the line, but even as you stand and wait your turn, you show mercy and kindness. That's the difference that Christ makes. Christmas is about home. God comes home to us in Jesus Christ and shines a light. I would be a lost ball in tall grass if it wasn't for Jesus when it comes to understanding God. But in Jesus, we can see exactly what God is like and what God wants from us. It's this simple. There was a father who had two sons, and now the father stands on the porch waiting for his son to come home. And we all understand that who God is is the Father who loves us and goes out on the porch every day and looks down the highway hoping that we're coming home. That's all what God wants. That's who God is. So much so that the Apostle Paul wrote to his church and said, Jesus Christ is the perfect image of God. And Jesus himself said it. Don't you understand? He said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so we don't have to be confused about God. We live in the light and see the face of God and know who God is, that God is love. And we know what God wants us to do. There was a good Samaritan who didn't pass by, but stopped and took a risk and covered the cost to someone he didn't even know and became to him a neighbor. That's what God wants from us. And so Jesus comes into the world and shines the light and changes the world because he brings the light that shows us the face of God. Just a little light, just a little light makes all the difference in the world. Last year for Christmas, Aaron gave to me something I've wanted for a long time. Technology has changed everything. It's changed flashlights. Did you know it changed flashlights? Now I own a flashlight that's about that big, has 1,200 lumens in it. I can stand here and shine all the way to Sandy Springs and just show you... The there you go. That's where. One candle, just these candles. One candle, 12 and a half lumens of light. But turn this room into utter darkness and light one candle and everything changes. Jesus Christ and changed the world and changes our lives when he shines his light into our hearts because he reveals to us the face of God and the nature of God and who God is and how God loves us and what God wants from us. But the bad news, there's some bad news. Not everybody wants to hear that. 
John owns up to it and says Jesus came to his own people. His own people really didn't want him. They didn't want him. They didn't want his message. They didn't want to hear what he had to say. They didn't want his challenge. And they rejected him, but not everybody. To those who accepted him, to those who believed in him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the power to live like children of God. And sometimes I look around and we live like everything else but the children of God. But to those who love Jesus and live in his light and receive his light, we actually become like Christ and become the children of God, people with whom God is pleased. That's the difference that Christ makes. That's the difference that Christmas makes. That's the difference when we receive him into our hearts and lives. There's nothing more important in the world than that we believe in Jesus and believe in his name. That's what connects us to God and changes who we are and how we are and how we relate. How wonderful that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But John, he doesn't tell his story. He says, what God really wants is for Jesus to be born in you. Be born in you. Three times in my life, redneck and clown that I am, three times in my life I've been to the Holy Land. Three times in my life I've walked into Bethlehem and into the place where Christ was born. He was born in a cave you could call it a barn. They used caves as barns in Jesus' day and time. And so I'm standing in a cave where Jesus was born, or certainly within 50 or 100 yards, if tradition can be trusted. I'm standing in the cave where Jesus was born. And I thought, oh my goodness, frog in my throat and tears in my eyes. I thought, what, what world is a fool like me standing here? And the bishop in the Methodist church read the Christmas story from Luke. In the cave where Christ was born, he read the Christmas story. And then his devotion, his word was very simple and straight to the boy. And he said, you're standing in the place right now. You're standing in the place where Christ, our Savior, was born. He said, I wish you would stop and think right now of where you were, where you were when Christ was born in you. Where were you? And so I would ask you this morning, where were you when Christ was born in your heart and life? When faith came to you and you really trusted in Christ, really trusted in God's love, where were you when Christ was born in you? Or if I can be so bold, if that has not been your experience yet, maybe one day you can say, you know, I was in the Alpharetta Methodist Church. And there was some preacher, I can't remember his name, but he was funny. He was just funny. And a man who could really sing took one word and turned it into an anthem. And it was in the Alpharetta Methodist Church, of all places, where Christ was born in me, born in me. Let us pray. Almighty God, with frog in our throat and mist in our eyes, we think of the humility of Christ who accepted birth in a manger in Bethlehem. And we pray now that he'll be born in us anew, that we might live our entire lives as your children. In our Savior's name we pray to you. Amen.